Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports. And to start off the new college football season, I'm going to be doing another series. This time it's going to be a bunch of lists because we all love lists, right? Well, hopefully we do because over the course of the next few videos in this series, I'm going to be going over the best upsets in college football before 1945, the best upsets no one talks about, the strangest or weirdest upsets, and also the biggest busted teams before the year 2000. I'll get more into that when I get to that episode. That'll be at the end of this series. But I'm starting off this series with a list that I don't know if anyone's ever done before, and I've always been interested in this. I'm going to be going over the most important ties in the history of college football, since ties can no longer happen in college football and couldn't after 1996. We haven't seen one in quite a while, and also this list will probably be the least controversial of the lists that will be coming up in this series, so that is another reason why I wanted to start off this series with this episode. But these ties are going to be ranked based on my ranking, so if you don't like it or if you have another tie to suggest, please go in the comments below and tell me. Also, make sure you like and share this video, and of course, make sure you go down below, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, ring the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos that are coming up on the channel. Also, check out my social media, my podcast, and also help out the channel on my Patreon. Those links are all in the description below. But to start off this list at number 10, I'm going to be starting it off with the oldest tie on this list, 1874, the game between Harvard and McGill. But due to this game taking place almost 150 years ago, no video or pictures really exist of this game. So I'll go quickly about this 1874 matchup, which was, again, the first ever recorded tie. But also it's on this list because it was the first game that was done with rugby rules. Yeah, the first game that actually took place between Rutgers and Princeton a few years before this in 1869 was mostly played under soccer style rules and also there were upwards of 20 players playing on each side. The first game these two teams played was the day before this one and it was played with Boston style rules which also involved them carrying the ball but also kicking too. The rules for the second game was more of a rugby style and more looking like what American football would look like in the future. It did have 14 players on both sides, but this game did have rules to it. It did have three periods, and it got Harvard to play rules like every other team was playing with at this time. There were only about a dozen or so colleges playing around the country, but they were all playing under these rules. So this game and Harvard playing under rugby rules brought them into college football circles, where in the next five years, Harvard were playing Yale and Princeton yearly, and they would be one of the top teams to beat, and you'll be hearing more about Harvard on these upset lists in the future. Number 9, 1982, SMU and Arkansas. This game is important because it kept a team that was about to go on probation again and eventually get the death penalty. It took them out of the national title, and it also caused a rule change. I'll get into that in just a second. But first, the team in question is SMU, as in 1982, SMU was the best, with the Pony Express of Eric Dickerson and Craig James running around everyone and being undefeated with a 10-0 record, and this game being their final regular season game, all they needed to do was win it, and they would be the Southwest Conference champion. In 1981, SMU won the Southwest Conference title after a season finale win over Arkansas, but couldn't go to a bowl game due to the team being under probation. And 1982 was going to be different, as there would be no probation, and they would actually have a chance to win the national title. But there were also rumors swirling pretty much the entire season that would eventually come true of more probation to come. Due to SMU being perceived as a dirty school, they were never ranked number one through the 1982 season and often were jumped by teams. They would get to number two just two weeks before the final game versus Arkansas and were all set and ready to go to the Cotton Bowl and a chance at the national title, but more on that in just a second. Meanwhile, Arkansas only had one loss in conference play, and that was an upset of sorts as Baylor beat them a few weeks before. So if Arkansas could win and then beat Texas in their final game, they could win the Southwest Conference title. The game was a back and forth affair with two ties until Arkansas took a 17 to 10 lead. SMU did have some time left to save their season and went on a long drive. And it looked like the drive was going to end until Arkansas was flagged for a controversial pass interference play. 
And since that penalty was a spot foul instead of 15 yards at the time in college football, the ball was placed near the Arkansas 15-yard line. SMU would obviously take the penalty and would score easily to tie the game at 17. SMU could have went for the win with a two-point conversion, but didn't, and that was their only blemish, which I guess was all the voters needed to do to bump them down to number four behind two teams that already had a loss on their record. All the thoughts about SMU being a dirty program, the game ending in a tie, and that controversial call gave the voters all they needed to justify not giving SMU a national title, even though they would end up being the only unbeaten team this year. Also, the game caused changes to the pass interference rule over the following summer, so that a pass interference penalty would be a 15-yard penalty instead of a spot foul, so you can thank this game for that. Number eight is gonna be 1946, the famous Notre Dame and Army tie. This was the first real number one versus number two matchup as the AP poll was regarded as the top poll at the time. And Army was coming off of two straight undefeated national title seasons, as well as having a Heisman winner in their backfield and the future Heisman winner, which I'll get to in just a second. Army was scoring insane numbers in 1944 and 1945, averaging close to 50 points per game and actually one of those seasons they did have 50 points per game. They were scoring 70, heck, they were scoring 50 on Notre Dame at that point, and I'll get more to that in just a second. Meanwhile, Notre Dame was coming out of World War II with their legendary coach Frank Leahy back on the sidelines after taking a four-year break for the war. Notre Dame was scoring 30 points per game and had just beaten Navy the week before 28 to nothing. With the war now over, the 1946 season was the first real season after war, and college-age men were back on campus and back on the field. And Notre Dame was back to their early 1940s level again, and ready to challenge the Army team. The last two times Notre Dame had faced Army, they were big shutouts, 50 points or more. So having a lot of their team back and their coach, plus a future Heisman winner in Johnny Lujak back on the field, a lot of people thought they could compete with Army this year. The 1946 game was also famous because it would be happening in Yankee Stadium, and the namesake of Game of the Century was given to this game weeks before. But even though the team scored a lot during the season and in other matchups, this time around it was a defensive affair, as in the first half Notre Dame got to the Army 4-yard line, and instead of kicking a field goal, they went for it and didn't get in, so it was a scoreless half. The second half saw neither team enter the red zone, but the biggest play of the game was Johnny Lujak making a touchdown saving tackle on Doc Blanchard in the open field, which was something no one had ever done before. The saving tackle resulted in Notre Dame intercepting Army on the next play to keep it scoreless, and that was how the game would end. Notre Dame showed that Army could be beaten and were just a mistake away from getting that upset. But the biggest thing was that Notre Dame had stopped Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis from scoring, which was something no team had done before either. Glenn Davis would end up winning the Heisman Trophy a few weeks after this game, and Johnny Lujak won it the next year, meaning three Heisman winners were on the field at the same time in this game. Coming in at number seven is the most recent tie on this list from 1994. It's Florida and Florida State, the famous choke at doke game. This game is famous because of the namesake and also because of the epic comeback in the fourth quarter, but also because it sullied both team seasons, and I'll explain that in a moment. But this game was between two 9-1 teams and both in the top 10. Florida State were the defending national champions, but had to replace their Heisman winner with a future NFLer in Danny Cannell, and of course they had the legendary Bobby Bowden. Florida State's only loss on the year was to Miami, and if they could beat Florida here, they could jump back into the top five. Florida, meanwhile, were ranked number four after losing by a field goal to top 10 team Auburn earlier in the season. But even with the loss, they were all ready to meet Alabama next week in the SEC championship game for a possible chance at the national championship. They just had to win this game. And through the first half of this game, or about the first three quarters of this game, they were looking really good, as they were up 31-3 as the start of the fourth quarter began. With Florida fans celebrating in Doe Campbell Stadium and probably getting their hotels ready for next week, Florida State slowly started to get rolling as they would get two touchdowns quickly in the first five minutes of the fourth quarter. Florida would start to waste some time, but not enough, as Florida State would get another touchdown with five minutes left 
to cut the deficit to seven, and quickly this was now becoming a game. Florida's offense was scrutinized throughout that season, and it was more evident in this game because they kept throwing the ball, which didn't waste a lot of time and set up a lot of mistakes. That mistake came about a minute after the previous touchdown, as Danny Werfel, who was only a sophomore, threw an interception, giving Florida State a chance to tie or win. Florida State wouldn't take too long to do so, as they would score again with only 1.45 remaining. Here was a big decision, as Coach Baden would go for the extra point, even though a lot of his assistant coaches pled with him to go for the win. Coach Baden would say after the game that he didn't want to lose this game after such an amazing comeback, so that was the reason why he kicked the extra point. Florida would have another chance with about a minute and a half to go, but couldn't do much, giving Florida State another chance to win, who also couldn't get into field goal range as this game ended 31-31. The tie resulted in both teams moving down in the rankings, and it hurt both teams since there wasn't a winner and neither team could get a big win to move up in the rankings, which was significant since the Bowl Coalition, which was what was running this season to put number one versus number two together in a bowl game to find a national champion. So since neither one of these two teams could get into either one of those slots, they really had no shot at this point. Florida would end up beating number three Alabama the next week in the SEC title game, but that tie really hurt them from jumping into number two. And since neither one of them were number one or number two, Florida and Florida State would end up meeting up in a rematch just about a month later in the Sugar Bowl where Florida State came out the winner. This game was important because even though it wasn't the exact reason why overtime would happen, this was one of the big reasons why people wanted to have overtime, and they would have overtime starting in the 1995 postseason and then eventually starting in the 1996 NCAA season. At number six is a game that doesn't get talked about a lot. It's 1958 Air Force and Iowa and their tie. The reason why this game is on the list is because it put Air Force on the map. Air Force had just started playing football less than five years before this and were in their second season at the university level. Air Force were led this year by first year head coach Ben Martin and he was given the task of keeping this team competitive in games. Meanwhile, their opponent Iowa was just coming off some pretty good years as they won the Big Ten and went to the Rose Bowl only two years before this. And the previous year in 1957, they went 7-1-1 and were a top 10 team. In the 1950s, Iowa and most Big Ten teams didn't play a lot of out-of-conference teams, but since Iowa didn't have another opponent, they were looking for one to fill their schedule, and Air Force fit right in since they were an independent at this point. Another reason why this was scheduled was because Iowa wanted another home game, and Air Force didn't mind playing on the road since they didn't have a home field for a few years. The game was looked at as a warm-up for the tough Big Ten season starting next week for Iowa, but instead the game was hard fought, with Iowa missing several tackles and blocks, resulting in Air Force staying close in this game. Towards the end of the game, Iowa would have another chance, but couldn't get close enough for any points, and the game ended 13-13. The tie would do a lot for both teams as it gave a kick in the butt for Iowa, who trounced Indiana the next week and went on to win the Big Ten and the Rose Bowl that season. Meanwhile, Air Force made a name for themselves with this huge tie versus a big time team and they continued to do things throughout the rest of their season, like winning their final eight games to be 9-0-1 and ranked in the top 10 and would be invited to their first ever bowl game, the Cotton Bowl that year. Iowa would also heap more praise onto Air Force and give them credit at the end of the year, saying that the tie helped them win the Big Ten that season. And now we are in the top five with one of the most famous ties in college football history. It's 1968, Harvard and Yale, their 29-29 tie. Now the last game was about a comeback, and this one is also about a comeback, but more about the legacy that it created afterwards. Yale were very good in the late 1960s under their coach Karm Koza, and it was because he found his best quarterback in Brian Dowling. Dowling was a famous name before he came to Yale because he had only one loss in football throughout high school and led the freshman Yale team to be undefeated in 1965. He played a little in 1966 before getting hurt, but in 1967 he showed off going 9-1. 
1968, the team was seen as a top team, not only because of Dowling, but also because of their running back Calvin Hill, who led the team in rushing in 1967 and would eventually go to the NFL. But in 1968, Yale were 9-0, and no team was getting within two touchdowns of them all season. Their opponent and biggest rival, Harvard, were also coming into the game 9-0 and looking to win the Ivy League for the second time in three years. Harvard was also the last Ivy League team to beat Yale, and they also had a future Hollywood star on their team in Tommy Lee Jones, as he was a guard on their line. The game was even bigger as this was the first time both teams were undefeated in 60 years, and when the game started, 40,000 people were in attendance in Boston and were shocked when Yale were up 22 to nothing before halftime. Harvard would switch their quarterback, which led to some points before the half, but they were still down by double digits. In the second half, the Harvard offense was a little slow with their starter again, so they switched it up and went with their backup again in Frank Champy. But he was running out of time. Yale scored to make it 28-13 with 10 minutes left, and instead of going for two points, they went for the extra points, as the Yale coach thought there was no way that Harvard would catch up at this point. And it was looking that way as Yale was driving again, but fumbled for the sixth time deep in Harvard territory. Harvard took the ball down to score with 42 seconds left. They went for two and got it, and it was now 29 to 21. On the onside kick, Harvard caught more luck as Yale tripped over themselves to give Harvard the ball again. Harvard took 39 seconds to get down to the 15 yard line before a thrilling pass to the end zone to get a touchdown to make it 29 to 27, just as time expired. Since the game couldn't end without the extra point conversion, Harvard had a chance to make another play. They would take it and pass for the two point conversion for the thrilling 29 to 29 tie as thousands of Harvard fans rushed the field to celebrate as if they won. And that's more of a reason why this game gets the legacy because of the famous headline, Harvard beats Yale 29-29. Coming in at number four is a famous one versus two matchup from 1966, the famous Notre Dame-Michigan State tie. And this is a famous game and high on my list, not only because it's a one versus two matchup, but because this game wasn't really supposed to happen or be seen. First off, these two teams didn't have each other scheduled before the season started, and this game only came together a few weeks before the season started. But after Notre Dame lost an opponent and Michigan State lost an opponent, they both had an open date and would schedule it, and by the luck of both schools, this game was scheduled late in the season when both teams were undefeated, so this game would be a de facto national championship game. Also, this game wasn't supposed to be seen nationally due to both teams using up their national television window already, but after so many complaints throughout the country, this game was shown nationally and drew over 33 million watchers. Michigan State were coming into this game known for their huge defense, with standouts like Bubba Smith, who would be the number one pick in the draft. Plus, they were winning games by 20 or more, and hardly anyone could get through their brick wall defense. Notre Dame, meanwhile, was also known for their defense, as they had five shutouts this year. But the last time these two teams played in 1965, Michigan State easily won at 12 to three. Many thought that this game was going to be low scoring due to the defenses, but also due to the cold, frigid weather that was happening in East Lansing, Michigan that day. The game would start slow with no points until the second quarter, and in the second quarter, Michigan State would manage to get a touchdown, as would Notre Dame, but Michigan State managed to get a field goal as well, being up 10-7 when halftime came. In the second half, the game was even rougher than the first half, with many players banged up, like Notre Dame's starting quarterback, Terry Hanready, who was knocked out in the first quarter, but Notre Dame was still able to drive down the field to get some points in the second half, the only points of the second half, a field goal to tie it up at 10. After that point, due to the injuries and not wanting to lose, Notre Dame head coach Ara Parsegan chose to run out the final minutes and tie the game at 10. The tie was controversial because it left the national title up to the voters, and since Notre Dame had another game left versus USC the next week, which they won big, they were picked as the national champions, and Michigan State had no chance because they weren't invited to a bowl game since the Big Ten only had one bowl invite, and they also had that weird no-repeat rule. So Michigan State's season ended 9-0-1, not winning the national title, even though many people thought after this tie game that Michigan State were the better team. 
And we're going back a hundred years for number three, the 1922 Rose Bowl and the classic tie between Washington and Jefferson College and the University of California. And this game might be a weird one or one you might not know about, but once I tell you why it's on this list, it won't be a shock to you. For one thing, do you know where Washington and Jefferson is located? Well, I'll give you a second. If you don't know, it's in Pennsylvania, and right now it's currently a Division III school. So that'll give you even more of a clue as to how small that school was 100 years ago. The other team in this game was Cal, who had not lost a game in over two years and had won the previous national title. So them being picked for the Rose Bowl was no shock since they were the best Western team this year. Washington and Jefferson was a shock though being picked for this game because they were a very small school. Like I said, they're currently a Division III school. At this point, they only had 350 students, but they were able to upset Eastern Power Pitt early in the season. And after going 10-0 with winning their final six on the road, they got the coveted invite to the Rose Bowl. Washington and Jefferson would only have enough money to send their coach, Greasy Nangle, and 11 players, meaning that if anyone got hurt in this game, they would have to play on. And on the cross-country train ride to this game, a player would actually get sick, but luckily the team thought about it beforehand and stowed away a player. Yes, this is a story. They stowed away a player who was able to play in the game, so they would actually have 11 players for this game who would have to play all 60 minutes. And besides the fact that they had only 11 players for this game, this game would also have many firsts, like Washington and Jefferson playing the first black quarterback in the Rose Bowl in their quarterback Charles Fremont West. They also played freshmen in this game, and they also would have two players that played in two Rose Bowls for two different teams, as they played on Washington and Jefferson and a naval squad a couple of years before this. But even with all that in this game, it was a defensive affair like most were at this time, with neither team coming close to scoring, and thus it ended in a scoreless tie. Even though Washington and Jefferson didn't win the game, them just stopping California in this game was a huge shock and a huge win, as Cal scored in every game for the last two years. Coming in at number two, this is the 1910 tie between Vanderbilt and Yale. This game is high on my list because it was the first great showing by a Southern school over a top Eastern school. Yale were coming into the 1910 season after a perfect 1909 season, and they only suffered one loss in the last 40 games. Vanderbilt, meanwhile, were a really good Southern school, but they weren't the best yet, and they couldn't become that because they couldn't play other schools besides Southern schools. They tried to, as Vanderbilt did play Michigan several times from 1906 to 1909, plus they also played Ohio State but they weren't able to play the big Eastern schools, i.e. the Ivy League schools. Yale, though, would finally accept a game with them to be played on October 22nd, 1910 at Yale. The game would be played in the rain, which slowed down both teams a bit. But Vanderbilt was able to scare Yale with a couple of long runs, getting into scoring territory, but they just couldn't score. Luckily for them, they didn't let Yale score, which was a bigger story because Yale had scored in their last 20 home games. The scoreless tie would gain Vanderbilt and Southern football nationwide acclaim after Grantland Rice wrote about it and further promoted Southern college football. So I know Vanderbilt's not good right now, but you might want to thank them for helping out Southern football about 110 years ago. And coming in at number one is one of the most controversial ties in college football history, the 1973-10-10 Ohio State-Michigan tie. This 10-10 tie drew more controversy and more stories for decades, not really due to what happened during the game, but more of what happened after the game. But the game itself was for all the marbles, as it was supposed to resolve the Big Ten title, as well as the national championship, since both teams were undefeated at this point. Due to the rivalry and the high stakes, 105,000 people were in attendance in Michigan Stadium to see this bruising affair. And bruising affair it was, as Michigan would struggle throughout the first First half and Ohio State would take the advantage, being up 10-0 when halftime came. After half though, Michigan would make a complete change to their offense and defense and they would be able to score 10 points to tie it up at 10. But late in the game, Michigan's quarterback Dennis Franklin would break his collarbone and Michigan would have to go on without him. 
They would get two chances for a game-winning field goal, but couldn't connect, and the game would end in a 10-10 tie. But the real story though would happen after the game, as both teams were tied for the top spot in the conference and a spot in the Rose Bowl. To resolve it, they would have a vote between all of the athletic directors in the Big Ten. The vote would push Ohio State to the Rose Bowl, and what made the vote even more controversial was that Michigan State had the deciding vote and picked Ohio State over their in-state rival for the Rose Bowl. Along with the controversial vote that would happen after this game, more changes would come to the Big Ten due to this game. One big change was that, finally, more than one team would be able to go to a bowl game, which was big at this time because bowl games were looking for bigger and better opponents, and the Big Ten up until 1973 were only letting their champion go to one bowl game and leaving the rest by the wayside. Starting less than two years later, the Big Ten would start to allow multiple teams go to bowl games, and nowadays they have 10 teams that go to bowl games. So you can thank this game for helping out the Big Ten finally get with the times. Also, if you want to make a Michigan fan mad, just bring up this game too. But anyway, thank you so much for hanging out with me and checking out the top 10 biggest, most important ties in college football history. I hope you liked it. Give it a like. Also, share this video with other college football fans. And of course, subscribe to the channel below and check out my podcast and help out the channel on my Patreon as well. You can check out those links in the description below.